morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our speakers, audiences, and chairs of ACNS webinars in different parts of the world. We are back again with another session of ACNS webinars for you. The first speaker for today is our honored guest from Switzerland, Professor Mahmoud Messer. Professor Messer is a neurosurgeon specializing in skull based surgery, especially in endoscopic skull based surgery at the Lucerne University Hospital in Switzerland. He has operated more than 1,000 pituitary adenomas. He is the author of more than 120 publications focused on skull based surgery, and he is also a member of several neurosurgical societies. He is a member of the board of the skull based session of section of the European Association of Neurosurgical Societies with whom he has co-authored several consensus articles on skull-based pathologies such as craniopharyngiomas, pituitary adenomas and other pathologies. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at a webinar and today he'll be talking about endoscopic management of cellular and paracellular tumors. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from China, Professor Shen Wenjun. Professor Wenjun is a consultant in pediatric neurosurgery at the Children's Hospital of Fudan University. And he has received advanced training from Boston Children's Hospital and skull base and cerebrovascular training from the Fudan University, Shanghai. He has received several awards and recognitions for his illustrious career, including the National Third Surgical Award, Chinese Medical Association, Neurosurgery Society in the current year. He has several publications in various peer-reviewed international journals, and we are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars. And today he'll be talking about endoscopic treatment of cranial synostosis. The chair for the first session of today is an honorable guest, who is from Japan, Professor Masamichi Kurosawa. Professor Kurosaki is a professor in Division of Neurosurgery, Department of Brain and Neurosciences, Totoro University, Faculty of Medicine, Japan. He has a vast experience in the management of skull-based tumors, especially treating the tumors of pituitary gland endoscopically. He is a member of Japan Neurosurgical Society, Japan Endocrine Society, and Japan Society of Skull-Based Surgery, and Japan Society of Pituitary and Hypothalamic Tumors. He has published several articles in various peer-reviewed journals, and we are extremely thankful to him for accepting an invitation to chair the session of Professor Mahmoud Masrar. The chair for the second session of today is an honorable guest who is from Japan, Professor Kazuaki Shimoji. Professor Shimoji is a consultant neurosurgeon, Department of Neurosurgery, International University of Health and Welfare School of Medicine, Narita City, Chiba, Japan. Professor Shimoji's surgical expertise is focused upon pediatric neurosurgery and endoscopy. He was previously an associate professor at the Juntendo University. He is a member of several Japanese societies, including the Japan Society of Endoscopy, Japan Neurosurgical Society, and Japan Stroke Society. He has published several articles in various peer-reviewed journals and is also an invited faculty to various workshops and conferences organized around the world. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Shen Wenjun. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yukata, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs as well as the distinguished audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over the virtual podium to the first chair, Professor Masamichi Kurosaki. Nice to meet you, Professor Mesera. Nice to my meet name you. is Kurosaki. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much for your kind introduction, Raja. My name is Kurosaki from the Department of Neurosurgery, Tottori University, Japan. Tottori Prefecture is the western part of Japan. It's truly an honor to chair this session. Uh, the session deals with the issue of endoscopic surgery. Let me briefly introduce Professor Mahmoud Misra. He's a neurosurgeon specializing in endoscopic skull based surgery at the Lausanne University Hospital in Switzerland. Uh, he's a member of board of the skull based section of the European Association of Neurosurgical Societies. And his presentation is entitled Endoscopic Management of Cellular and Paracellular Tumors. Uh, Professor Messler, please start your lecture. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much for ISCN to, to invite me in this wonderful uh, session. So I will talk about uh, endoscopic endonasal approach for cellular and paracellular uh, lesion. To start my communication, I have uh, the f my, my first question is, uh, is the endoscopic endonasal approach a mini invasive approach? When we start uh, endoscopic approach in 2010, before this, I used the, the classic uh, uh, transphenoidal surgery with uh, the speculum. This is the procedure before 2010. And we put the speculum and we can work in a blind uh, working. 
uh, we use the curette, we use the, the, the section, and we can remove the, uh, the pituitary adenoma essentially in the axis. But when we shift uh, for the full endoscopic approach, the opening is widely, and we can work inside the cavernous sinus. Here we can see both ACA, and we can work with the vision inside the cavernous sinus with mobilizing the internal carotid artery inside the, the cavernous sinus. So the resection is better because the view is better, but the complication is also higher when we compare to the classic uh, transphenoidal surgery. This is a case operated uh, three years uh, ago. The patient uh, come uh, for- Transphenoidal surgery. Patient is a four. The, the patient uh, came for headaches and diplopia uh, with the, this adenoma inside the, the cavernous sinus, the right cavernous sinus. The procedure was an endoscopic endonasal approach. It was three years ago, and I did a classic endoscopic approach. This is the middle turbinate. I push it the middle turbinate. We expose the anterior part of the sphin with the sinus, and classically, I open the sphenoid with the, this tool, uh, the osteotum, to preserve the bone of the anterior wall, I use it for the skull basal reconstruction. But in this procedure, when I used, uh, when I used it, I had a huge bleeding from the internal carotid artery. It, is, well, it was very difficult to manage this bleeding, but you have to do this procedure fast because it is an emergency procedure. So it is not a mini invasive uh, uh, procedure. You can have a uh, serious complication after endoscopic endonasal. So the time is precious in this kind of uh, complication. You have to stop the bleeding with the cotonoids and the hemostatic material. And after that, we go uh, in emergency. The bleeding is stopped here after two, three minutes. And we go in emergency in the angiography room. We perform the uh, angiography. And we can see here the fistula. Désolé, je n'ai pas bien entendu ce que vous avez dit. The fistula after angiography. <laughs> Our radiologist uh, team performed the, an embolization in emergency, this is the coil uh, in the cavernous sinus, and uh, this is uh, after the procedure, and we can take intact uh, the internal carotid artery. So it is very important uh, to prevent this kind of complication. It's not uh, just uh, uh, a simple procedure endoscopic approach, and you can have uh, a serious complication. And we can, when we see the literature, we can see here the relationship between the experience of the surgeon and uh, the vascular complication. When you operated uh, less than 200 uh, uh, procedure, the rate of uh, vascular complication is 1.4%. And we, when you have more experience, more than 500, the rate of complication is uh, less than 0.5%. In my experience, I had uh, two ACAs injury and more than 500 cases of uh, pituitary neuroendocrine tumor, one carotid cavernous fistula, direct fistula, and uh, one uh, ACA rupture. So to answer of my first question, is the endoscopic endonasal approach a minimally invasive approach? The answer is no. The endoscope is a tool. You have to use this tool <coughs> to uh, uh, ameliorate your uh, gross total resection, 
and to improve uh, your results. How to avoid complication? Uh, before uh, endoscopic uh, uh, surgery, it's very important to analyze uh, all this factor, nasal anatomy, pneumatization of the posterior pa uh, paranasal sinus. It's very important to analyze the, the, the sphenoid sinus. If you have a concha type sinus, the neuro, the neuro navigation is very helpful. You have also to analyze all the septation inside the cavernous, uh, 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 the sphenoid sinus, because the septation can guide you for especially microadenoma. The relationship between the tumor and the optic nerve and the chiasma, it's very important to uh, prevent uh, uh, damage this uh, uh, important uh, uh, nervous structure. Also, it's very important to analyze if your tumor goes to the cavernous invasion or no inside the cavernous sinus, it goes lateral to the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and uh, exactly where is the tumor inside the cavernous sinus in the superior part, inferior part, medial or lateral and surely the anatomy of the internal carotid artery, it's very important to analyze and especially when you have a, a complex tumor of the skull base. Let's go to the, our topic. I will uh, talk about median lesion, essentially pituitary adenomas. It represents more than 90%. Can you find joma 10%? I will talk about uh, can you find joma. Meningioma, just uh, situated in the midline and cleaver lesions also. For the paramedian lesion, I will talk about cavernous sinus lesions, pterygoid lesions, and the Meckel's cave lesions. For pituitary adenoma, this is our theory uh, published uh, three years ago, more than uh, 500 patients uh, for uh, non-functioning non pituitary adenoma. Uh, uh, the gross total uh, resection was achieved between 60 and 70%. Uh, for secreting adenoma, it depends. For GH adenoma, the, uh, the remission was between 65 and 90 percent, for proactinoma 55 percent, and for ACTH microadenoma between 55 and 90 percent. We will see why we have uh, 50 percent and 90 percent. This is our result comparing the endoscope and the microscope technique. Uh, before 2010, uh, uh, I used only the uh, microscope. This is the black uh, uh, color. Uh, the, uh, the, it was not, there is no difference between the CNOSP uh, 0 and 1 between the microscope and the endoscope. But if we compare the CNOSP 2 and 3, the difference is statistically uh, significant, especially for CNOSP2 and uh, CNOSP3. And when you have also a tumor more than uh, 20 uh, millimeter for supracellular extension. Why? It's very simple. When you use the endoscope, the view is better and you can uh, have more resection and gross total resection. And also, when you have the invasion of the cavernous sinus, especially for CNOSP4, there is no difference, uh, except when you use the endoscope for transcavernous uh, approach. This is the classic uh, approach for uh, pituitary adenoma. It's important to analyze the uh, nose and the different structure. When you introduce the endoscope, immediately you can see the inferior turbinate. This is the right no uh, nostril, the middle turbinate, and the nasal septum. And uh, posteriorly, we have to expose the anterior wall of uh, the sphenoid sinus. This is the both ostea, the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus. 
before uh, before my ACA injury, I opened the anterior wall of the sinusoid sinus by the osteum, but now I open with the, the speed drill. After opening the sinusoid sinus, we remove all the septa, and uh, it's uh, very important to identify all the anatomic landmark. In the midline, we can see the planum here, the tuberculum, and the cellar floor, and inferiorly, the cleaver recess. Laterally, we can see the prominence of the paracleaver carotid artery, the carotid artery C5 segment, the optic nerve, the lateral optical carotid recess, and the medial optical carotid recess. For classic pituitary adenoma, it's enough to open just the cellar. When you have to do an uh, extended approach, you have to open the tuberculum and uh, the planum also. This is the video. We open the floor, we open the dura, and after that, we expose the adenoma and we can remove uh, with the, the classic uh, uh, technique. For uh, GH adenoma, we performed meta-analysis uh, in uh, 2018. This is our result. There is clearly a difference between micro and macro adenoma. The rate of remission is higher when you deal with microadenoma. You have a rate of 77%. If you compare to macroadenoma, the rate is just 50%. And of sure, when you don't have an evasion of the cavernous sinus, the remission is 70%. If we compare to the invasion of the uh, sinus, uh, uh, cavernous sinus, the rate of the remission is just uh, 30%. This is an example of uh, GH uh, secreting pituitary adenoma with the invasion of the cavernous sinus. We can see here the microadenoma inside the, the left cavernous sinus. This is the procedure. I did a classic endoscopic endonasal approach with just uh, uh, the cella, I opened the cella uh, lateral to the ACA to go to the cavernous sinus. This is the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. We open this medial wall and we enter inside the, the uh, left cavernous sinus and we can remove the tumor inside the cavernous sinus using the curate and uh, the suction. It's very important to go uh, step by step and to uh, see also the carotid artery. The carotid artery is just here. This, this is the carotid artery. There is no residue. But after we're removing this uh, part of the tumor inside the cavernous sinus, it's also very important to uh, inspect all the cavity this is the diaphragm, and we can see here there is no residue in the superior part between the diaphragm and the, the uh, medial wall of the cavernous sinus. But in the other side, there is a small residue here, and it is very important to take out uh, this residue. Uh, the there is no residue here and the patient was uh, cured after this uh, surgery. For tyrotropin secreting pituitary adenomas, it's a very rare lesion, uh, and the rate is between 1 and 3%. And uh, for the remission, the rate is like GH pituitary adenoma, the rate is uh, 70 percent after endoscopic endonasal lesion. When you deal with a pituitary adenoma or pituitary tumor, don't forget you can have also rare pituitary lesions. And you have to think about this rare pituitary lesion 
because the treatment is different and the prognosis also is different. In my experience, I had 5% uh, uh, of rare pituitary lesion. Uh, in uh, our series, uh, we had uh, uh, metastasis, pituitocytoma, granulocytoma, germinoma also, uh, lymphoma or gongliocytoma. I want to share with you this case, uh, this lady, 60 years uh, lady, she came with the oculomotor palsy and on the right side uh, and clinically she had pan pituitarism with the diabetes insipidus and after the MRI we can see here the tumor with the supracellular extension with the invasion of the right cavernous sinus and the lesion is also located on the, the right uh, orbit. After surgery, the diagnosis was uh, primary pituitary lymphoma. Pituitary lymphoma, primary pituitary lymphoma is a very rare, uh, less than 0.1%. Uh, Generally, the patient uh, uh, has immunodeficiency and 80% of patients present of cranial nerve deficit with the diabetes insipidus. The treatment is completely different uh, uh, about, uh, uh, and we use uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So uh, it was just an example of rare pituitary lesion. You have to think about this rare lesion and uh, uh, the rate is between five and 10%, and especially when your patient uh, uh, has isolated uh, diabetes insipidus or prior medical illness, you have to think about non pituitary neuroendocrine lesions. When we talk about pituitary uh, lesion, uh, generally, and in my experience, I use a transfinoidal approach for more than 95%, but we have a small indication of transcranial approach. I will talk about uh, the small indication also uh, for transcranial approach. This is a public for uh, two, uh, 2011. And uh, as you can see here, this is the classical counter indication of uh, transphenoidal approach. When you have a retrocellular portion, subfrontal portion, or dumbbell-shaped tumor, or a small fossa, uh, or uh, 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 sinus, sinus type uh, concha. But all this uh, classical contraindication for transgenoidal approach, now it's uh, a good indication for endoscopic endonasal approach. We can reach all this kind of tumor and we can get uh, uh, gross total resection. This is an example of uh, uh, pituitary non-functional uh, adenoma. Uh, the diagnosis was performed in 2004, first uh, post-operative MRI, and we can see here the residue of this tumor after classical transfernoidal approach by the microscope. The patient was also operated uh, in another institution in 2011 by transgenoidal approach and the result was also bad with this tumor inside the cavernous sinus and with this supracellular extension. I operated this patient six months ago. I started with the removing of the intracellular portion this is the intracellular uh, portion. And when we analyze the, uh, the image, we can see here this enhancement. This enhancement is the diaphragm. When you want to reach this supracellular part, it's very important to open the diaphragm. And this is the diaphragm. If you don't open this diaphragm, you can not reach this superior part of the tumor. After opening the diaphragm cellar, we go to the 
superior part of the tumor. This is the superior part situated here on the right side. And after that, we can go to the other portion, this portion. This is the right portion. This is the optic nerve, the carotid artery. And we have a last portion here. And we go gently to take out uh, this last portion. This is the post-operative MRI. And we did a gross total resection thanks to this uh, extended approach. Another uh, difficult uh, tumor uh, is uh, the pituitary neuroendocrine tumor when the tumor is very hard fibrosis. You cannot aspirate the tu this tumor. This is a video. We can see the tumor is very hard and we can suspect this kind of tumor when we see the T2 images. The signal is ESO or hypo signal in T2. This is a very hard tumor. We cannot take it by the section. We have to cut this tumor with the burking uh, step by step to go uh, to the gross total resection. You can see here the tumor is very hard and we did an extra capsular resection. This is the arachnoid and this is the tumor here and we did an extra capsular resection after a debulking of uh, the tumor. It's very important to predict if the tumor is hard or soft and to do extra or non-extra capsular resection and extended or classical approach. So the indication of transcranial approach is when you have a giant pituitary adenoma, but not all the giant pituitary adenoma. Classically, when you have giant adenoma, the first choice is a transcranial approach using the endoscope. What is the indication of uh, transfenoidal approach? Uh, the first line is uh, endoscopic endonasal approach, but when you have an irregular multinodular shaped tumor like this uh, with the effraction of the arachnoid, extension of the tumor lateral to the supraclinoid internal carotid artery, or in the temporal fossa or large subfrontal, or when you have an enhancement of uh, subarachnoid arteries, it is a good indication for transcranial approach. This is an example of combined surgery. This is a huge adenoma with an enhancement of the supraclinoid and, uh, ACA, and the tumor goes lateral to the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. It is a good indication to combine the technique the patient operated with the FTOZ craniotomy, combined it with the transphenoidal surgery for the sphenoid part. This is the result. Uh, we had just uh, a small residue inside the uh, left, uh, uh, in the right, uh, excuse me, uh, cavernous sinus. And this residue was treated by gamma, uh, by uh, gamma knife. And the residue was uh, stable and the patient uh, is uh, well after six years of follow-up. The indication also of transcranial approach when you have an apoplexy after transphenoidal surgery, especially when the tumor is very fibrosis and the, the initial surgery is, wasn't good. This patient was operated by endoscopic endonasal approach uh, after uh, post-operative, uh, the patient had an important decrease of left visual acuity and the patient was operated in emergency. In this kind of situation, this tumor after, uh, after this stroke, I can talk uh, about stroke, stroke of the tumor is very, very hard. 
and you have two choice and the time is very crucial. The first choice is immediately transcranial approach or in the hand experience, you have to do an extended endoscopic endonasal approach for an extra capsular uh, de decompression. This is the post-operative MRI and uh, the patient uh, uh, has improved his uh, visual acuity. Other indication of uh, transcranial approach after uh, first surgery already performed by transcranial approach for functioning pituitary adenoma and the residue is not uh, accessible for uh, transcranial approach. This is an example. This patient has a, a, a Cushing disease. This is the tumor uh, uh, inside the cella, inside the, the left cavernous sinus and goes superiorly here. The patient was operated by endoscopic endonasal approach and we did uh, a good result, but uh, this patient uh, superior to the, to the uh, anterior clinoid is present uh, after this first surgery. And in this situation, we have two choices. The first choice is uh, GK, or the second choice is uh, surgery. But GK is not possible because the tumor is too close to the optic nerve and the tumor is functioning. And we know when you have functioning pituitary adenoma, the dose is higher, 25 January degree, and it's not good for the optic nerve. So we have just one option is transcranial approach. And we did the transcranial approach for this patient this is the tumor and the optic nerve and the third nerve. And we operated in this uh, Dolange triangle by a uh, transcranial uh, uh, approach. Other indication of uh, transcranial approach when uh, endoscopic endonasal approach is contraindicated, when you have an ectopic pituitary adenoma, especially acetyl secreting adenoma, inside the third ventricle or into the pituitary stalk, or also when we have a kissing carotid, the uh, corridor is very small and the endoscopic approach is not conjugated, but uh, it is very difficult in this kind of uh, situation, especially when you have a, a big uh, supracellular extension. So transcranial approach in pituitary neuroendocrine tumor is indicated in giant multilobulated adenoma, especially when you have an enhancement of the uh, uh, arteries. When you have an apoplexy of residual tumor after transrenoidal surgery, non-accessible residue after transrenoidal surgery, especially in functioning pituitary adenoma, ectopic pituitary adenoma or kissing uh, carotid with a big supracellular extension of the adenoma. Now we will talk about uh, uh, meningioma. In my experience and in my center for all anterior skull base uh, uh, meningioma, I never use the endoscope. I can use the endoscope uh, as a tool uh, uh, assisting the microscope but sensorily, I prefer transcranial approach is more fast and I have uh, less complications. The only <laughs> situation when we use the endoscope in this kind of situation, when, I, uh, when we have a diaphragmatic meningioma with the infra diaphragmatic and extension inside the cella. This is the video of this meningioma, we open the sinoid sinus classically and uh, this is the meningioma and we can take out uh, this uh, meningioma with uh, a small opening and the tumor is uh, very accessible by endoscopic endonasal approach 
So it's the, uh, the same surgery than uh, pituitary adenoma. The tumor generally is more harder, but uh, with uh, aspiration and uh, piecemeal resection, you can do a good resection. This is the post-operative MRI. So the only indication for me uh, for meningioma is infradiaphragmatic meningioma for uh, anterior and middle skull base. We use the endoscope to uh, uh, as assisting, but not uh, full endoscopy for meningioma. Other excellent indication of uh, endoscopic uh, endonasal approach is cleaver lesion. This is a chordoma, and especially when you have uh, an extra dural uh, chordoma, this is the preoperative MRI. Uh, the tumor uh, goes to the inferior part of the clevis without intradural extension, and the tumor is limited in the midline. It is an excellent indication of uh, endoscopic uh, endonasal extended approach. Meningioma, it's another uh, kind of situation because the tumor per definition is uh, uh, intradural. In this uh, uh, kind of surgery, it's very important to, uh, to close uh, widely the skull base because the very important complication in this kind of surgery is uh, the CCF leakage. And uh, this is uh, the flap, the naso uh, uh, septal flap. Uh, the, the excision was subtotal. This is a small residue uh, treated by gamma knife because the dissection was impossible. The tumor infiltrate uh, uh, around the basilar artery. This is another good indication of uh, endoscopic endonasal approach. You can see here the tumor in the inferior part of the clitoris, and it goes to the occipital condyle. Now, first of all, we have to open uh, widely the sinuid sinus to expose the superior part of the clivus. After that, uh, we go to the coana and we open the mucosa to expose the middle clivus. After that, we drill the middle uh, clivus to have a good uh, exposition. After that, we can take out the tumor. The tumor is just in front of us. In this uh, kind of surgery, the complication, what is the complication? The complication is the uh, sixth nerve. The sixth nerve uh, generally is situated in the middle part of the clivus. And when it goes also uh, to the condyle occipital, the, don't forget the 12 nerve. And uh, we use also uh, the uh, stimulation to detect the 12 nerve. And we can stop generally at 0 0.2 uh, when we have a stimulation. This is the stimulation. We take out the tumor. This is the middle and inferior part of the clivus. And and the, 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 the 12 is not so far from here. And we can use the stimulation. This is the stimulation. And we have a good stimulation after that. And the patient. Uh, was normal after uh, the surgery without uh, complication. Let's go to the craniopharyngeal. The second frequent tumor in this uh, region is craniopharyngeal. It represents 10%. But sensory, it's completely different about uh, pituitary neuroendocrine tumor. It's another animal, craniopharyngeal. And even Pathologically, uh, the tumor is benign per, per definition. When we look at the complication after the surgery, the rate of the complication is between 15 and 
vision deterioration in 20%. We have diabetes and CPDs in 90%, pituitary deficit in 90%, and hypothalamic dysfunction in 90%, especially when you have gross total resection. The rate of CCF leakage is also 15%. What is the problem of craniopharyngioma? The problem of craniopharyngioma is not the pathology, but the location of this tumor. The tumor generally is located in the supracellular space with a relationship with the optic nerve, anterior carotid artery, uh, internal carotid artery, all the perforant, uh, and when we deal with this tumor, you have also to deal with all these complex vascular nervous structures. How to classify craniopharyngioma? Because classification is important to uh, manage and to uh, organize your surgery. The first classification is Yazargir classification, published in 1990. Uh, intracellular, supracellular, ventricular. Look, the, uh, the tumor is classified in six types. Other classification, subdiaphragmatic or supradiaphragmatic. Kassam classification, pre infundibular, infundibular, retro infundibular, and for gripe curve, intraventricular. Uh, an important classification is Nicker classification. Uh, this classification is based on the invasion of the hypothalamus. For grade zero, there is no invasion. Grade one, the hypothalamus is just deplaced. And grade two, the hypothalamus is involved. But uh, nowadays, we don't have uh, one classification combining all these important uh, uh, classification based on the diaphragm because it's very important to differentiate uh, the, the, your tumor. Is your tumor infra or supra diaphragmatic, uh, supracellular extension, uh, the invasion of the infundibulum, the relationship with the optic chiasma, the third ventricle, the hypothalamus, uh, if there is a lateral extension of the ACA. So, we have a lack of classification, but it's very important to combine all this important anatomic uh, structure to have your classification and to uh, manage your case. Before, before surgical treatment, uh, all uh, neurosurgeons have to ask uh, this important question. What uh, should they do a complete resection or limited resection followed by radiotherapy? It is the first question. And the second question, what is the approach? Endoscopic approach or microsurgery approach via transcranial approach? To ask uh, uh, for the first question, uh, gross total resection or near total resection, and when we see the literature, uh, some author claim it as surgery, you have to do gross total resection because the result is better. It is also the same for uh, uh, Osama El Mefti or uh, Kenji Huata. All these guys claim it the importance of gross total resection, and we can see here the uh, free survival uh, curve is better when we do gross total resection if we compare to near total resection forward by radiotherapy. But on the other hand, there, is, there are many uh, articles. Uh, they said completely uh, the opposite of uh, the first. Uh, and they claim that you have to do near total resection forward by radiotherapy and the result is better, better than gross total resection. We have many articles uh, for uh, that. Uh, look at this. 
uh, our findings demonstrate that uh, subtotal resection followed by adjuvant radiotherapy decreases the risk of obesity without increasing the local recurrence rate compared to gross total resection. Uh, two years ago, I, I tried to, to answer for this kind of question and we created a task force from uh, the ENS skull based section along with the renewed international expert from Asia, from India, and from all the world. And we constituted to formulate evidence-based recommendation about surgical management of craniophalangioma. We did a systematic review uh, according to PRISMA criteria from January 97 to uh, 2019. To ask which approach. When you see these two patients, these two patients, we are in front of craniofarangioma, but it's completely different. Why? It's not just the volume. But we can see here a huge part lateral to the internal carotid artery to the temporal fossa. And we, when we see this huge craniophalangioma, the tumor is strictly median without lateral extension. So for surgical approach, the, we recommended the use for traditional endoscopic approach for purely intracellular craniopharyngioma, when the craniopharyngioma is located purely intracellular or infradiaphragmatic, endoscopic approach is a very good option for this kind of craniopharyngioma. Also, when you have a retrocosmetic extension, and without lateral extension to the ACA, craniopharyngioma still uh, an excellent approach for endoscopic uh, endonasal approach. We recommend the performing, uh, when you use endoscopic endonasal approach, it's not classically procedure because we have to do an extended approach and we recommend when you use a, uh, an extended approach to close with the nasoceptal flap to limit the risk of post-operative CCF leakage. This is an example of uh, treatment of craniopharyngioma by endoscopic extended approach. This is a sample draw of nasoceptal flap. This is the nasoceptal artery. We drew the first line vertical, inferior to the nasoceptal flap. After that, horizontal. After that, another vertical here. And the last one, superior to the nasoceptal artery. It's very simple to do. You don't need ENT for this. And you can perform in generally in 30 minutes your nasoceptal flap. After performing your flap, you have to put it inside the kuana to have a working uh, area. After that, it's very important to open widely your sphenoid sinus and to visualize all the important anatomic landmen, the cellar floor, A recess lateral and median, and the carotid artery. This is the opening for craniopharyngioma. As I said, it's not a standard approach, it's an extended approach. What is extended approach? You have to remove all the tuberculum and goes laterally to the medial optical carotid recess. It's very important to expose the medio carotid, optical carotid recess here to see the emergency, the emergence of uh, the optic nerve. If you cannot see the optic nerve like this on the both side, you can, uh, you can have a complication and injure your optic nerve and your chiasma. Another important artery is the inferior here 
hypophyseal artery because this artery supply the chiasma and the optic nerve. It's very important. This is the artery here, and you have to go gently and to aspirate little bit with your uh, cosa. For the reconstruction, it's another important time. We use uh, fat and our septal flap. And with this technique, you can see here the gross total resection and the naso septal flap in and said after uh, Gadolinio. This is a video sent in, uh, by a colleague. Uh, I can't uh, uh, name my colleague. But it's important to see this. It's not a good uh, method to resect craniopharyngioma. It's uh, very dangerous to do like this. I want just to share what you have not to do. The, here we can see the opening is very, very small. We can see the important anatomic landmark. And as you can see, the surgeon is just pushing the tumor. It's very, very dangerous because you can have a serious complication, especially vascular and uh, uh, optic complication. Please don't do like this. You have to open widely the tumor and to, uh, to visualize, visualize your important uh, anatomic landmark. This is another example of uh, an excellent indication of endoscopic endonasal approach. The tumor is uh, loc uh, located strictly medially, but there is a small issue here. We can see the inferior part of the tumor is in retrocellular and uh, goes inferiorly. So it's very important to expose this uh, inferior part. I will show you after how we can do this. This patient was, this is the initial MRI. This patient was operated in another institution by transcalosal approach here. And the surgeon did just uh, a small biopsy without an excision. This is the post-operative MRI. After that, the patient was operated also by transcranial approach, second surgery, and this is the residue, especially in the inferior part of the retrocellular portion and in the interpeduncular fossa. For this patient, I did an extended approach by endoscopic endonasal approach. It is the same procedure. We cut, uh, we did a uh, middle tubicnectomy, nasoceptal flap. This is the opening of the dura, enter cavernous sinus. And this is the, the optic nerve. We remove also the pituitary gland because after the second surgery by transcranial, the patient had a complete pan pituitarism. And to go to this inferior part, it's very really important to do a posterior clinoidectomy. This is the posterior clinoid. And now we can see easier the inferior part of the tumor. And we use B manual dissection. This is the arachnoid. The technique is the same as microsurgery technique. It's very really important to preserve this arachnoid. It is the anterior part of the Lilliquist membrane. And uh, when you preserve this, you, you can preserve also all the perforant and uh, the basilar artery. You can see here the basilar artery is here. And we can expose all the inferior part of, of the tumor. After exposing the tumor, the technique is the same. We cut inside the tumor and we use the CUSA for debulking the tumor to do a piece meal resection. Uh, 
after that, we do a good reconstruction uh, with putting the fight inside and generally just the nasoceptor flap after or biological reconstruction, just a little bit a glue and that's enough. You don't need to put all this synthetic material. And uh, now I have less than 1% of CCF leakage with uh, this technique. This is the post-operative MRI and we did gross total resection. However, when you have a lateral extension on the internal carotid artery inside the temporal fossa, it's very important to do a transcranial approach. We cannot approach this tumor by the endoscope, especially if the tumor goes lateral to the internal carotid artery. This is the optical carotid uh, triangle. We can work inside this triangle. We can work also between the optic nerve and lateral to the carotid artery. We have an excellent uh, exposition and we can did uh, a good uh, resection. This is the pre-operative MRI and this is the post-operative MRI after transcranial approach. So when we have lateral extension, we recommend performing a transcranial approach for this kind of tumor. Extent of resection and hypothalamic involvement. Do, uh, what we have to do, gross total resection or subtotal resection? We recommend performing a gross total resection when there is no infiltration of the hypothalamus. Don't damage the hypothalamus because the complication of the hypothalamic syndrome is very complicated and the morbidity is very higher. This is an example. The patient was operated by endoscopic endonasal approach. We did gross total resection, but we can see here a small residue inside the, the right hypothalamus this is the growth. And after that, we decided to treat it by gamma knife. And the three years after, there is no residue inside the hypothalamus. And this patient uh, is normal without uh, hypothalamic uh, syndrome. It's very important to preserve, in my opinion, the hypothalamic function in, in uh, uh, craniophalangioma surgery. So take home message for craniophalangioma. Uh, endoscopic endonasal approach is an excellent option for intracellular and for midline tumor. When you have lateral extension, transcranial approach is preferable. When you, have, uh, when you don't have an invasion of the hypothalamus, go to the gross total resection. But when you suspect the invasion or post-operative hypothalamic dysfunction, it's preferable to do near total resection forward by radiotherapy. Let's shift for tospterygoid approach now. It is a, a, a case comes for this uh, huge tumor in the pterygoid fossa. Uh, the first step, uh, it's an extended approach. It's important to open all the sinus, sphenoid sinus here. We open widely the sphenoid sinus. We open also the maxillary sinus to expose all this pterygoid region. And when we start, it's very important because it's mandatory to have a strategy and a plan. We know the paracleaver artery is here. So it's not easy to, to go to the, uh, to identify the paracleaver ACA, like the vision nerve and the classical uh, identification, because in this kind of situation, the tumor destroy all this important anatomic landmark. So it's very really important to go step by step. The first step is to go for, for medium to lateral. 
after that go from more lateral to the middle and uh, progressively we uh, try to identify the paracleaval artery. This is the paracleaval artery here we can see the paracleaval artery. The first step is to go from medial to lateral and you have to stop using navigation and the Doppler. The second step is to go from lateral to medial. And finally, we identify the, and, uh, the paracleaval ACA. After the identification, we can go to the cavernous sinus and we did a transcavernous approach for this infiltration. This is the cellular floor and the cavernous sinus and the paracleaval lesion. This is the post-operative MRI. We did a good resection that there is a small residue in the posterior part of the cavernous sinus. This residue is treated by proton therapy. Another non-tumoral lesion, it's a very rare condition, lateral sinuid encephalocell. We can see here the encephalocell uh, located on the lateral wall. This is the lateral recess of the sinuid sinus. It is an excellent indication of endoscopic endonasal approach, but we have to do a transpterygoid approach to repair this uh, uh, encephalo cell. This is the surgery. This is the encephalo cell here. After opening the maxillary sinus, sphenoid sinus, this is the pterygoid process. And this is the encephalo cell here. For lateral lesion, it is uh, here, th this patient came for six nerve uh, palsy, and we can see the tumor is inside the left cavernous sinus. This is the operative exam, and we can see here the six nerve left is paralyzed. It's very important to open and we can see here the septum and the lesion is on the left side of the septum. So we identify the septum and we have to open on the left side. This is the pituitary gland. It's also important to preserve the pituitary gland. This is an hemangioma and we go inside the cavernous sinus. This is the pituitary gland. We preserve with the cottonoid and we go inside the left cavernous sinus. This is the cavernous sinus, the posterior clinoid. You don't have to do clinoidectomy in this kind of situation. And we have to go gently by piecemeal resection of uh, this uh, hemangioma inside the cavernous sinus. This is the carotid artery, carotid artery. And uh, we have a small residue in the superior part of the cavernous sinus. We did a complete resection and uh, the patient has improved his uh, sixth nerve uh, palsy. The last case is Michael's cave lesion. It was uh, th this patient uh, I operated this patient in Lyon with uh, my mentor, uh, Emmanuel uh, Joanneau from Lyon, 10 years ago. But sincerely now, for this kind of lesion, I don't perform this extended approach because we have other option. Uh, also, endoscopic is not uh, uh, minimally invasive surgery. We can reach by transcranial approach, interdural. It's very easy to uh, 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 to achieve uh, this uh, tumor by transcranial. We can also treat uh, this small tumor by GK, but I want just to show you how we can do it 
by uh, extended endoscopic endonasal approach. We perform a nasoceptor flap to uh, protect uh, the intercarotid artery. This is the video nerve. It's not uh, uh, mini invasive, it's very extensive uh, surgery. We have to drill inferior and the carotid. This is the internal carotid artery. And we skeletalize all the internal carotid artery, paracliver, and C3 segment to individualize V2, V2, and Michael scale. And after this uh, huge procedure, we have to open the Michael scale to retain the, uh, the, the schwannoma. So we can do it, but it is not uh, a good uh, option now in my mind. So to conclude, for uh, cellular and uh, paracellular lesion, uh, endoscopic endonasal approach is a very good option for, not for all tumor, but you have to select your patient and you have to use all your amarmentum, the endoscopy, the microsurgery, radiosurgery also to, uh, to treat and to, uh, to give uh, the optimal option for your patient. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, it's already past the scheduled time, closing time, but we'll take questions from the audiences, one or two questions or comment. Yes, yeah. of course. We can ask our course, Dr. Liu Bun Seng, to say his comments. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, Raja. Uh, thanks, Professor, for a very extensive and uh, comprehensive talk. Uh, Professor, I just want to find out for you, do you think that now a CT3D uh, is still relevant uh, with the advances, I mean, the uh, good images from MRI, especially looking at the bone, and in what cases that we need to do a CTA or angiography or DSA? And, and uh, Professor, uh, my last question, Professor, uh, if you encounter the, the falling down of a diaphragmatic uh, cella early in the surgery, uh, what tips and tricks that you use uh, to push it away or to uh, uh, make it out from your operative field? Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for the first question, uh, the indication of uh, city angiography is, uh, I, I don't perform systematically city angiography for pituitary adenoma or for uh, craniophalangioma. The only indication is in complex tumor, especially in a paracellular lesion, uh, like mm -hmm. chondrosarcoma or chordoma. But in uh, routinely uh, MRI and uh, CT scan is enough to, uh, to analyze uh, uh, pituitary lesion and uh, craniophalangioma. Uh, for uh, your second question, uh, I don't understand your second question. Uh, on diaphragmatic that, cella that fall onto your operative field early, it cut, it close up, up your space, look at the tumor. How how do you tackle it? How do you make it away from your operative field? Diaphragmatic cella. Uh, for the reconstruction of the skull base? Uh, is no. No, I uh, mean in a pituitary adenoma, uh, intraoperatively, if you sometimes we were taught how to avoid it to fall off, fall down to the operative field early because you obscure the, the operative field. So do you have any specific uh, tricks and tricks uh, uh, to, to make it away from your operative site, the diaphragmatic cella? Oh, for diaphragmatic cella? Yes, yes, Prof. Okay. Uh, it's very important to analyze the situation of uh, your tumor if the tumor is uh, strictly infradiaphragmatic or supradiaphragmatic. And uh, it is uh, essentially important when you have dumbbell shaped tumor. When you have dumbbell shaped tumor, I suspect the, the, the opening of, of the diaphragm is very small. And if you cannot cut your diaphragm, you cannot achieve this uh, supradiaphragmatic uh, portion. Okay, so it's very important to open your diaphragm when you have a dumbbell shaped tumor and in a repeat surgery when you uh, operate a second or a third time, generally the tumor is superior to the diaphragm and you have to do an extended approach 
to individualize your diaphragm, to cut your diaphragm and to reach your supra uh, diaphragmatic lesion, or you have to do a transtubercular approach. You have two kinds of, uh, of approach. Thank, thank you, Professor. Dr. Nujerling Vargas has a question. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Professor, for your conference. It was very acknowledgement. I would like to know, you mentioned fibrous tumor. Have you ever used ultrasound aspiration for those kind of tumors and what is your experience? Yes, yes, I use it uh, uh, ultrasound aspiration in uh, craniopharyngioma and fibrosis uh, tumor. Yeah, it's very helpful, but uh, you have, you have to, to use uh, a gentle aspiration because you can, uh, you can open your diaphragm and you can have a vascular injury if uh, your aspiration is uh, very high and speed. Be careful when you use uh, ultrasonic aspiration inside the cellar. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. If there are no more questions, we can have the concluding remarks from Professor Totori. Okay, uh, I'd like to ask a question if I may. At first, uh, uh, Professor uh, Messera used the word, medical term, uh, pitnet, pituitary neural endocrine tumor, maybe, uh, not pituitary adenoma. Maybe pitnet was named uh, uh, neuropathologist or uh, pituitary pathologist. So in Japan, not yet the pitnet is uh, not uh, familiar with our neurosurgeon. You use the pit net uh, in Europe? Yes, yes. Uh, it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, uh, in Istanbul, uh, two years ago, uh, we, we discussed it with a Japanese uh, surgeon with the, uh, in the Pituitary Cl International Club. Uh, Nishioka. Yeah. Dr. Nishioka or uh, Dr. Yamada. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm in the same uh, group and we discussed it with the uh, neuropathologist, as I, uh, mm -hmm. I think you yeah, know that's him. Right. And uh, in Lausanne, I work also with uh, De La Rosa. He is one of uh, neuroendocrinologists. And now we use this term. We published two or three papers about uh, mm -hmm. nomenclature of neuroendocrine tumor and not uh, pituitary adenoma. And in this last uh, two years, I used neuroendocrine tumors because, uh, as you know, pituitary adenoma, we, we can have uh, metastasis, we can have, it's not just a benign tumor like uh, just adenoma. And using the nomenclature of pituitary neuroendocrine tumor, PITNET, uh, I think is, is more uh, true. Yeah, maybe in near future, the name of the pituitary adenoma uh, changed into the I, PITNET. I yeah. think, but yeah. not, not, not yet familiar with our neurosurgeon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And Thank one more question. Uh, uh, especially performing the uh, craniopharyngioma cases, uh, you the nasoceptor flap is so important to uh, to prevent CSF leak. And in Japan, also uh, several neuro uh, surgeon, pituitary surgeon, use the uh, suturing technique. Uh, we sutured. Uh, dura with fast uh, fascia. How how do you think? What do you think about the suturing technique, dural suture? You know? Yeah, yeah. Sincerely, uh, sincerely, I try it, but it's very difficult to suture. It's complicated. Fascia. It's very so, complicated, and I uh, the time of suturing is. <laughs> I try it, but uh, for me, uh, when using um, the flap is better yeah, because yeah. vascularization is yeah, yeah. full for this uh, mm -hmm. uh, structure and uh, this reconstruction of the skull base. So I don't have uh, enough experience in the suturing uh, of the fascia 
and the Jura in extended approach. But uh, for craniopharyngioma, I do a systematically nasoceptal flap. Yeah, in Japan, we do the suturing technique is recommended because we do use uh, chopsticks every day ah. uh, in Asia, yeah. <laughs> that is my question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Right. Thank you very much before going on to the next. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. So I'd like to inform our viewers that this is being broadcast in different channels like WeChat, Zoom, and YouTube. And we're extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for arranging a WeChat broadcast for today's webinar. And right now, there are more than 1,500 people who are watching this live over all the platforms. So we're extremely grateful to Professor Shubin. For the next session of the webinar, I would like to invite Professor Shimoji to say a short introduction, who would in turn invite Professor Shen Wenchun. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Kazuaki Shimoji from Japan, uh, International University of Health and Welfare. I would like to introduce uh, Professor uh, Shen uh, from China, Shanghai. Uh, he, com he comes from Pundan University and an expert of endoscopic surgery. Uh, in craniopharyngioma, uh, no, cra not cranio, cr craniosynostosis, uh, it is now shifting to a less invasive surgery. So I'm excited to learn about, uh, learn a lot from his lecture. Uh, Professor Shen, can you start your lecture? You have 40 minutes. Dear colleagues, I'm Wen Junshen, and I'm from Shanghai Children's Hospital of University. Our hospital is the uh, one of the very three national children's medical centers in China. And I'm from the PH for neurosurgery department. And for me, the ACNS is always like a family. Um, this photo talks about uh, in 2014, uh, in Astana, Kazakhstan, I received the ACNS scholarship from the Professor um, uh, Yoko, and I'm very glad gratitude to her dedication to the society association. And I also my deep gratitude to Professor Tomita, uh, which is my mentor in Children's Hospital uh, of Chicago in the United States when I spent one year and a half uh, studying there. And before starting my um, topic, uh, let's uh, cherish the moment of the Professor Gurich, uh, who is the very uh, great master in the pediatric craniofacial new plastic site. Uh, today, I share the topic with your dear colleague is the new endoscopic treatment of the cranial stenosis. And uh, let, when we look back to the his, uh, review the history of the treatment, it is starting at the uh, 1880s when the LC Lane uh, study, the doctors in New York start with the strip craniotomy and they try to the, the treatment in a very young babies, but uh, very quickly they find that the such cases, such procedure will, will have a high recurrency. Uh, so when the time passed to the 20th century, about 1940 or 1950s, um, surgeon from the craniofacial plastic side, such as the Marlock or the Tisler, they develop several the, uh, surgical techniques uh, uh, to invent the major procedure for the baby's uh, uh, cranial shaping. But as the procedure was so radically, and the next gen generation of the neurosurgeon was thinking about to um, develop uh, less invasive procedures. Uh, there is a trend starting from the United States when it's 1990s, uh, doctors trying to use the endoscope uh, and uh, with the remodeling helmet to treat infant cranial stenosis. And uh, nowadays, uh, because of the um, um, 
uh, the history and then uh, the trends of the treatment. There are several treatment uh, choices. And because of the diagnostic of the babies uh, is so different. Some baby is very young, uh, early, early diagnosis, and some baby is very late diagnosis. So the treatment strategy is patients tailored, personalized. And uh, as I have mentioned, uh, uh, historically, there are several procedures style for cranial stenosis, such as the PI procedure or the modified PI procedure or the Steven ostotomy. And uh, the other of the cranial reconstruction. Um, and uh, later in the new centuries, uh, with the uh, computer associated uh, design to have the tablets and uh, with the uh, cranial uh, reconstruction. Um, uh, so several, there is a lot of the uh, surgical technique uh, when you're considering about the cranial reconstruction as the main strategy. So um, all of these strategies treatment strategy, they share the common principle or the goals. Uh, first, it opened the prematurely fusing sutures. The second is increasing the cranial cavity and the space. Third is the manager the cranial pressure. Fifth is to improve the cranial cosmetic appearance. And the last, uh, hopefully obtain the normal mentally development. And uh, in the 1990s, uh, there is a creatively idea from the uh, Gemenza and the Baron. Uh, they started to think about why not treat such baby with the endoscope. Uh, they do the uh, strip, uh, uh, they started with the strip ostomy and uh, in a very uh, cohort of the early diagnosis young patients, they have a very optimistic result. And, and they conclude that to get such uh, good results, there are three very key points. The first, the patient should uh, operatively earlier and, the, and the, with the post-operative rapidly grossing brain will cause the expansion of the skull into a normal shape. And the last with uh, uh, a remodeling helmet to helping in the introduce of the growth of a brain and the growth introduction of the direction of the growth. So uh, what's the uh, concept of the minimal in invasive or endoscope cranial onosis treatment? It's just that the, uh, the surgical insertion uh, is much lesser than the open ones or in from the it's not only the instrument such as endoscope and the minimal drill. I think the endoscope cranial treatment uh, uh, is more than the, the cranial stomatomy. Have several uh, surgical technique. Uh, obviously, it has the advantage of the minimal invasive approach and the follow all the principle uh, to the uh, origin. Uh, open surgeries. And uh, uh, when we look at uh, the nowadays, it's quite different from the 1990s or the, the beginning of the new centuries because uh, more and more patients are earlier diagnosis. And uh, the endoscopic is popularization uh, among the hospitals. Uh, so there is a trend that uh, more and more patients and more and more centers are deployed uh, endoscopic treatment for craniosis. And uh, very importantly, um, postoperatively, almost every patient needs a uh, uh, remote helmet to manage the uh, introduction growth of the brain. So in my opinion, uh, for the endoscope treatment, um, both the surgery and the remote helmet is equal to the result of the patient's appearance. Uh, let's take a look at the uh, uh, philosophy of such treatment. Uh, when we took the such uh, such stenosis as a, a for example, um, there is a strip strip uh, ostomy at the centers, 
and uh, there is several uh, state autonomy at the bilateral parental site when the, uh, the patient uh, is get a discharge on the post-operatively, uh, the head was pushed at the from the AP site, and there is spare the room for the introduction to introduce screws at the bilateral site. Um, when they they took the is another example as the unilateral uh, colonial sutures patients. Uh, these young patients will get the few sutures opens again and again there it was a uh, uh, helmet and uh, um, push uh, and stop the growth at the uh, contralateral side and the, the spare room or introduction of growth at the uh, at the uh, at the right side for the metal spec metal uh, stonosis uh, the treatment uh, strategy is such um, get the stop the growth at the AP site and the spare room at the both uh, frontal site. Um, so uh, when we look back uh, the difference between the uh, velar reconstruction and the endoscope treatment, uh, these two uh, treatment structure. Um, uh, although they share the very same uh, treatment um, common goals or principles, but there's still some difference between these two. I think the most important, everything behind this uh, strategy is the growth of the baby's head among the first year, especially the first half year. So um, I think value reconstruction, uh, relatively uh, it's a, a static strategy and the endoscope treatment is relatively a dynamic strategy uh, to 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 foreseeing to foreseeing the result of the uh, patient. Uh, for example, uh, the value reconstruction needed the result uh, one stage uh, as the baby was pushed out to the OR room, uh, parents and the doctor can see the result at the once. So um, they need the, uh, the, the condition of the ossification uh, as a stock as the, as the baby has already has a large portion of the skull to get it uh, for the reconstruction surgery. Um, and uh, probably this baby is, uh, has a larger month age and uh, his uh, Contemplation is uh, almost like over contemplation, such as for the sagittal uh, stenosis, where I have the frontal bossing or the uh, occipital bossing. Um, but for the endoscope treatment uh, strategy, uh, the, result, the result can be seen delayed, not at once, but maybe two or three or five months later. The ossification. Um, uh, when do the proce procedure, the ossification, the skull may be in is not inefficient, but with the growth of the uh, skull, uh, the head will reshaping. So the baby will, uh, normally has a lesser or younger mouth age. Um, so the result is foreseeing at the diametic strategy. Uh, nowadays, uh, from the 1990s, it almost uh, uh, more than 20 years passed. So the endoscope treatment is uh, not a new thing. It's already a major uh, treating uh, strategy. And the uh, most uh, literature uh, have concluded that the, the results, so far the results, the results from the uh, open side or the endo side is quite equal. But we do know what's the front line or the border of the endoscope strategy nowadays. I think uh, there are several debates or several different opinions uh, among um, uh, surgeons about the endoscope strategy. The first is whether to do the procedure over six months old baby. Uh, the second is uh, when meeting the uh, several uh, coronal or metopic quinonosis cases, uh, where well, the endoscope treatment carry out. Uh, the third is multiple suture quinostonosis cases. 
uh, the last year's the partial cranial expansion cases could be used uh, the endoscope. Uh, let me uh, answer these such four questions uh, in the uh, way of the case by case. Uh, as I have mentioned that the, uh, the surgical stenosis treatment, uh, uh, there is a, uh, a lot of variety, but you can share, see they share the common uh, points. Uh, that is the, you will open the skull at the um, bilaterally as close as close close to the skull base possible, uh, such as the pipe procedure, such as this uh, pain insular uh, bone flap, such as this uh, stable ostotomy uh, uh, procedures. Uh, they all want to get the uh, bone as open as close to the skull base. Uh, so this idea uh, we should uh, move, uh, share from the open side to the endo side. Uh, when do the endoscope treatment, uh, the key point is not the central strip or stotomy. The key point for success is uh, to open the bilateral uh, at the parental side or Professor Wenjun, are you here? Professor Wenjun, can you hear us? Hello, Professor Shen Wenjun. Please unmute your mic. Kindly unmute your... Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear us? Oh yeah, I can hear you. It's suddenly, it started, suddenly it stopped in between. Can you reshare it again? Oh, sure. Uh, sure, okay. Okay. And nowadays we have very naturally uh, um, a decision ways to decision the peristim from the uh, a skull and also to decision the dura from the skull. And as we all know, the endoscope uh, uh, treatment strategy has a, a very successful rate for the younger patients, such as for this uh, two months and a half old uh, sagittal stonosis. Just three months later, you can, this baby has already had a very optimistic result. Uh, this is another very young uh, baby. Um, but you can uh, see that uh, when, when I mentioned the two different uh, the difference between the two strategy um, for the endoscope treatment, uh, you sometimes you have to uh, tolerate the frontal uh, bossing at the first, uh, but with the helmet stopping the grooves at this side, uh, when the time passing, uh, all this uh, bossing will seem not so tory, and uh, and later the shape will give you a very of mystic and the harmony result. Uh, this is another five months old sagittal stenosis cases also get a very uh, good result. Uh, you can also see the patients had a uh, frontal bossing at the surgical time, but later, just four months later, uh, the situation gets improved. And as, as I mentioned that the real challenge is about the patients more than six months old. More than six months old, the, the skull is much harder. Uh, how to get the uh, barest the ostomy uh, as close as to the skull base? Uh, so this is the, uh, the, the drill. Uh, when you use the gel to get, get this stable ostomy as close as to the skull base. Uh,
And uh, this is uh, a seven months sagittal pineal nodosis. Uh, you can see months, uh, nice months later, uh, the patient has a very good result. So um, there is a breakthrough uh, from the six months to seven months. And later we try this strategy on, on uh, eight months sagittal pineal patients. Um, the short uh, follow-up shows a very good result. So I think um, the six months old is not a, a contraindication for the sagittal pineal stenosis uh, with the development of the surgical technique. And uh, the second challenge for uh, all the uh, all frontline or border nowadays is the severe colon colonal or the metotic uh, cases. For uh, normally, these cases will have uh, uh, FOA, um, but before I thinking about, uh, should we use endoscope to spare uh, this procedure? Let's review the anatomy at the um, um, at this side, the terrain side. Um, you can see there are several uh, sutures here. Uh, uh, we all know the coronal suture, but the coronal suture will uh, will get deeper to get to the frontal siphonoid suture and uh, the other siphonoid to parental sutures. Uh, and all these sutures will affect uh, each other. Uh, mostly, the coronal sutures affect the frontal uh, siphonoid sutures. And uh, the frontal siphonoid sutures will get secondary fusion in coronal cranial stenosis once. Uh, you can see in these slides, uh, for baby less than three months old, there will be 100% opening result. For baby is three to five months, uh, there is a, a 50 chance. For baby uh, larger than, uh, for baby larger than five months, there is a one zero opening rate. Uh, but this is the sedentary fusion, but when the uh, frontal siphonal sutures um, is get close, uh, he's alone, uh, you can see we we'll, we'll have the same manifestation with, uh, as the coronal ones. Uh, in these slides, you can see this patient suffer from the right frontal siphonal suture fusion, and uh, his appearance is likely like a right coronal uh, suture cranial stosis. So all this information gave us that, that the um, concept that the frontal siphonal suture is very important uh, to uh, get the uh, optic shaping. So in order to spare the FOA, there is a true condition uh, based on my initial opinion. Uh, this is the uh, traditional historically uh, uh, opening surgical technique. You can see uh, as long as the uh, bone flap, uh, there also uh, FOA is necessary. Um, but with the endoscope young patient, uh, as we all know, the few suture needs to be open again. Uh, this is necessary. Um, but should the FOA be spared, I think there is two condition. Uh, the first one is the frontal siphonoid suture uh, is open. Uh, when the, this suture is open, uh, the, opti the, the optical shaping will, will get uh, remodeling by itself. Uh, the other condition is that the, the exo optimism is negative. Uh, so uh, there is a it's a not urge, urgent need to change optical shape. Uh, for example, this five months old uh, coronal suture at the right side of the baby, uh, we do the endoscope uh, treatment. We have two insertion. We, one is at the very side of the coronal suture. The other is at the uh, terrain area to loosen all the um, uh, 
frontal siphonal uh, sutures there uh, you can see just three months later and uh, six months later the baby's head shape is get uh, around and uh, very optimistically uh, and the, all the um, coronal suture appearance have been has been improved. For the metopic sutures, uh, these sutures, uh, it's a very unique suture for baby. It starts uh, uh, fusion from the three months to the eight months. Uh, and uh, we can classify it to several stage um, from the mild to moderate to se severe type. Uh, and uh, historically, when the treatment, uh, treating the metopic stonosis patients, uh, the bone flap uh, reconstruct reconstruction is necessary for that. Uh, and the FOA is also recommended. Uh, and the, the, usually the FOA uh, is a very key point to get the appearance uh, successful reshaping. But when I see here, uh, you can see the, the open surgery of historical open surgery, but, but still they will have uh, around 10 or 15 recurrence rates. But when I'm thinking about the um, metastatic stonosis and those treatments, uh, as we all know, this uh, few suture needs to be open again, as we all know, under the endoscope. So there's an insertion here, but the BB will have the uh, uh, bad lateral frontal uh, under growth, uh, and we need to open the um, uh, growth space or the introduction, the growth at the um, bilateral frontal on both sides. Uh, so as the coronal ones, if the uh, frontal siphonal suture is open uh, and uh, we make a little, another little insertion here and then to open all the, uh, all, all, all the open sutures from the uh, coronal sutures to the frontal siphonal sutures there and uh, to, to loosen this bone shape and uh, to get the loose space for patients. You can see this is the two and a half months old baby. Uh, just three months later, his head shape get, will get um, in, improved. There's another more little baby, two and three months old. And uh, for the lymboloid uh, suture, uh, fusing cases. Uh, traditionally, we treat people, uh, uh, patients with this open cranial reconstruction technique. Um, but nowadays, parents uh, seldom accept this concept. So with the younger uh, patients, as I have mentioned, we will have a very good result with the endoscope treatment. This is a four months old. There's another younger, three months later, so three months old patient, this is four months later. Uh, for elderly uh, lymboloid quinosis cases, this is a uh, half year, six months old at the uh, left side, you can see with follow up, uh, half years later, his head shape will get more uh, symmetry. Uh, this is another uh, dramatically 10 months old lymboloid quinosis. I do the uh, endoscope treatment strategy, and the patient uh, also get a very optimistic result. And the last is the uh, so-called multi multiple suture fused one, uh, such as this case, we call it a buns, buns head. Uh, it's a affect the posterior posterior portion of the sagittal. Uh, suture and the, at the very the uh, proximal site of the bilateral lymboloid sutures. And uh, this patient also has a uh, uh, ossificated inferior internal occipital crest uh, at this side, you can see and this side is. So his uh, post fossa is very uh, narrow and uh, squeeze the cerebellum and also have the uh, uh, 
Chiari malformation. So traditionally, when treating these patients, you may think about the uh, post fossa expansion uh, with the destruction uh, instrument, uh, such as uh, this, such as this is kit or this is schematic uh, pro, uh, surgical plan. And uh, there are several uh, uh, surgical techniques developed uh, to treat this such situation. But when we do the endoscope, uh, I think uh, to open the view suture at the posterior surgical portion and uh, the both proximal bilateral lamboid sutures and uh, cross the signal uh, sinus, cross the sinus at both sides and uh, relieve the uh, carry formation at this side. Uh, all this insertion is not very long, can be done with the endoscope. And uh, the bone flap uh, beneath the skin uh, is uh, like a pain in secular in this shape. So dramatically, you can see this patient get to uh, improve sharply and uh, successfully just one month later, you can see uh, his post fossa expansion will get very good. And the uh, occipital uh, gets the towering. And uh, to get such result, result the remodeling helmet is also very personalized uh, uh, design. You can see uh, we spare this room uh, freely and openly for the booth. So um, I conclude shortly that um, endoscope technique for early cranial stenosis treatment uh, has already get an uh, excellent result. And uh, when we dig it in the skull base anatomy, uh, we deploy the new instrument. Uh, I think more and more and the well select patients will have uh, more many invasive chance. And the front line and the border of the endoscope treatment strategy uh, will get advanced. Uh, thank you all the guys and uh, uh, welcome to Shanghai. If any comments or question, uh, share with me through email. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Shimoji can proceed with his expert comments. Yes, Dr. Okay. Shimoji. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shen, ah, Professor Shen. Mm -hmm. it, was, mm -hmm. it was a great presentation and I actually, I do have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, I understand that uh, you need to dig all the way down to the uh, frontal fossa because these coronal, unicoronal synostosis cases and also bi bicoronal will have a, a, a developed sphenoid ridge. Um, and you told, you presented that you need to dig all the way down. And that concept is written in the 1940s or 60, 50s papers. So I, I totally agree with you that if you want to do that even endoscopically or uh, open surgery, you need to focus to remove the uh, overgrowth uh, uh, sphenoid ridge. And uh, how about the, how long do you follow these kids? I'm, I'm always um, interesting about how they develop because we are neurosurgeons, not a plastic surgeon. So this is another important point for doing these kind of new techniques. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm starting this uh, uh, endoscope strategy uh, from the 19, uh, from the 2017. Um, uh, so far, so good. Uh, the longest follow-up patients, I think, uh, four years. And uh, so far, there is no uh, recurrence. Um, everything good. Uh, and uh, uh, when we review the history of the treatment strategy, uh, you can see that at the very first 
uh, even at the uh, 1880s, uh, where all the pioneers uh, do the strip ostomy, I think the idea is good, but without the uh, development of the uh, engineering. So I think the remodeling helmet is very important. Uh, I will always um, talking about uh, with the parents or with my students that um, the helmet and the uh, surgical technique is both equal in this strategy. And uh, uh, well, after the procedure, uh, post-operatively, um, uh, I always uh, communicate with the provider uh, industry side uh, to how to design a personalized helmet to get the uh, best result. Mm -hmm. Is there any questions from the audience? Yes, sure. I would like to ask one question to Professor Shen. Uh, we have seen excellent results from your side. Thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. Uh, may I Thank inquire you. what about syndromic craniosynostosis? What is your experience with regard to syndromic patients like Crozen syndrome and other syndromes? Do you mm -hmm. really uh, advocate for endoscopic or open require? And this is a, a great question. Um, so far, I only do the non um, uh, syndromatic. Uh, so I I I, uh, I don't have such uh, experience in treating uh, syndromatic cases with endos with endoscopy. No. Yeah. Because I think, uh, yeah. Second question is uh, when you put your uh, incision in the temporal region, so you have to cut the temporalis. So when you are drilling, this temporalis will again come back to your, will close the uh, uh, area of drilling. So how do you uh, protect your, uh, keep you clean the area of drilling in the temporal region? Oh, um, uh, just um, um, irrigating and uh, um, uh, suction. Um, I think uh, these two ways. When we uh, when, when we dig in the um, temporal regions, um, sometimes we, as I have mentioned, we, we want to get dig as uh, as deep as to the skull base. So uh, you can see. Uh, very likely to the Kawazi approach. Yeah, approach, yeah. Okay, that's fantastic, Professor. New Jerling Vargas has raised her hand. I have one question. Sure, Professor Mahmoud Mestra. Sure. Thank you very much, Professor Chen, for your excellent presentation. Uh, I also started this technique uh, uh, two years ago, but uh, until now, I, I do just for sagittal craniostenosis. Why? Because mm -hmm. I believe in frontal orbital advancement. And uh, my question is, uh, do you think the result is, uh, is the same in uh, sagittal and coronal uh, stenosis? Or it's better, uh, the endoscopy technique in um, in uh, sagittal craniostenosis. Oh, okay. Um, I think um, um, for the sagittal cases, the endoscope uh, technique uh, will have a little, will have less concerns uh, um, when treating with the coronal or the metoscope cases. Uh, a lot of cases historically will need a. a FOA, as you have mentioned that, um, but you can, um, in my uh, slides, uh, I mentioned that I, I have noticed that um, uh, if the frontal uh, siphonoid suture is open, and this is very crucial, is open, and then the FOA can be spared. It's not necessary. And in such cases, even, uh, uh, Elder than six months could be treated with the endoscope strategy, and uh, 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 from the result view, uh, you can see uh, the reality is okay. So far, so good. Thank you, so far, so good. Thank you, thank you very much. 
Yes, Professor Nijerling Vargas. Thank you very much for your wonderful uh, presentation, Professor Shem. I would like to know if this is a solo surgery or you need a system or you use a robotic arm to perform this kind of surgery. Oh, um, this is a very uh, te technique question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, most, uh, all the cases are done by myself and the assistant is always the uh, rotating residency. And uh, I think the endoscope uh, coronal, uh, coronal stenosis treatment uh, uh, is not likely the, uh, like to the uh, first lecture, such as the endoscope skull base uh, surgery. I don't need uh, any pneumatic arms or the uh, mechanic arms. Uh, I just hold the endoscope at the one hand and uh, digging at the, at the other hand and uh, the residency helping in irrigating and the suction. Yeah, that's the secret. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. We can uh, have... My last question. Yes. What about the positioning of your patient? Mm. Um, uh, for such a tool, uh, I use the swan position, uh, like open ones. Um, uh, for the other... Uh, uh, just a uh, uh, home position, yeah. Thank you. Yes, my co-host, Glibun Singh, any comments from your side? Uh, yeah, I want to ask, do you encounter any case that you, you uh, uh, tear the dura? The dura was torn and how you deal with it in the endoscopic dura tear? Yeah. Um, in my very first uh, trial, uh, there is one uh, dura um, tearing um, at once uh, on the surgical uh, on the on the surgical field, uh, so I can see directly and uh, fix the dura at once. Um, but if you um, um, you but if you uh, mean the later dura uh, tearing, right, or or the uh, tearing um, by the um, in, per, in operation or delay the uh, dura tearing when the patient uh, discharge. Uh, there is no delayed uh, dura tearing when patient discharge from hospital. Uh, there is no, only one uh, dura uh, sharply tearing during the procedure. Uh, unfortunately by myself, uh, on my very, uh, earlier trial and I fix fix it at once, just one case. Yes. Hope it, this is helpful to you. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Any comments from Professor Kurosaki? Professor Kurosaki, would you like to say something? Uh, my simple question is: uh, uh, Do you have some experience with the uh, sinus injury? I mean the uh superior sagittal, superior sagittal sinus injury how do you hear how what do you think about you are in endoscope uh I, I, pardon i didn't get did it. you have did you have encounter any dural venous sinus mm -hmm. injuries like superior sagittal sinus injury oh okay really? no no uh, i always be, be, very be careful and uh, cautious uh, treating with his Sign us. No. Hopefully, Thank hopefully no. <laughs> Thankfully, <laughs> no. <laughs> so in that case, we'll wind up this session. We'll invite the final remarks from our honorable chair, Professor Shimoji. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Shen and everybody uh, attending this uh, seminar. Um, I remember that Professor Zera and Professor Goodrich didn't like this procedure. So, but the, the results from Professor Shen's uh, presentation is really tempting to shift to these uh, procedures. So I, I would like to say that we could have two options to treat these kids and we need to respect uh, our mentors and uh, Professor Shen's uh, results could be really, really uh, 
fascinating too. Uh, we learned that tonight uh, and thank you very much uh, for joining us. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much you. for those wonderful thank comments. Uh, in a nutshell, we can settle for single coronal synostosis as well as non-syndromic to be repaired endoscopically, whereas other complicated ones can be done openly. I hope everybody should agree to it. So I'll wind this up now officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yuko Kato. I'd like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Mahmoud Masrar and Professor Shen Wenjun and the chairs, Professor Masamichi Kurosaki and Professor Kazuaki Shimoji for the time and their support for the educational initiatives of the ACNS. A special thanks to Professor Shubin for supporting us in our educational ventures and suggesting world-class speakers as well as broadcasting this webinar in China. A special thanks to my co-host Liu Bun Seng also for joining me today. So until we all meet on next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from everybody. Thank you very much for joining.